produced by me. Uh, if you allow, I will sit down and try to copy what I'm saying. Okay. You may need to talk a little louder for okay. the people yes, in the back. Please, please. Or you may Tell want to just move up to the front. <laughs> well, I'm getting too, yeah, why don't you, that's a good idea. too much afraid of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now I'll shut the, the doors. Uh, So I, I will try to be audible, and I hope it's not too dangerous what I'm talking about, what I'm going to talk about. There is a word, uh, the word cryodynamics is in the title of my talk, and it's completely cryptic, of course, and I wonder whether it is a good idea to introduce a new notion at the beginning I mean, cryodynamics doesn't exist so far. And cryos means cold in Greek, ancient Greek. And uh, there is a science that everybody knows about in physics called thermodynamics. And cryodynamics is its sister discipline, if it really exists. And whether it really exists is not yet completely sure, because only very few people have written papers on cryodynamics so far each time my name was on the paper. So it's, <laughs> it's something you should, should be very critical about at the, from the beginning. But, uh, of course, any science, also a new science like cryodynamics, has a long history. And to introduce it, maybe it's a good idea to go back a little bit. How, how possibly could it happen that something as big as thermodynamics is being claimed to exist beside it, even though thermodynamics is one of the big founding mother disciplines of physics. It's classical originally, but it is. Uh, everybody knows that life, for example, is an example of thermodynamics, of irreversible thermodynamics. And uh, my friend Ilya Prigozhin, uh, he uh, devoted his whole life to understanding better the thermodynamics of irreversible processes. And uh, if you look at the sun, at the stars, at the universe, everything is irreversible. And life is believed to be feeding of negative entropy, as Schrödinger used to say and wrote in his book, What is Life? So, uh, we, there is no need for anything new in fundamental physics at the range of thermodynamics because we can explain everything we want to explain. We can understand life in terms of irreversible thermodynamics. So within there is this the heat death, there is the arrow, arrow of thermodynamics, which means that the universe should eventually end up in a heat death when everything has been equilibrated. When, when all differences in free energy and kinetic energy will be become even, evenly distributed across the whole cosmos. That's the heat death of, of Clausius. Clausius also introduced the notion of entropy. And uh, so uh, this is very old, very classical stuff. And biology is known to be part of it. And, why would one think that there is a competitor to thermodynamics on the same level as thermodynamics itself? So there is an uh, order that I think Fermi said that once. No one ordered cryodynamics. There is no... Uh, it's not so important <laughs> what I'm writing here. That why would anyone wish to have a new discipline beside thermodynamics in fundamental physics, classical physics, quantum physics. I, will, I, I try to be even more <coughs> loud. And the historical reason is that there is a phenomenon in astrophysics. 
and everybody knows about it, it's the redshift of the stars, of distant galaxies, which was discovered in 1929 by Hubble, the Hubble model, that the farther away a, a galaxy is, the more it is it redshifted, that is, it's, the light has a longer wavelength, and this increase of the wavelength, this decrease of energy, is proportional to its distance. Everybody is familiar with the Big Bang model, and this is a very interesting history, how, how this arose, and uh, nevertheless, I have to mention it here, because there is a Swiss guy named Zwicky, Fritz Zwicky, who had the basic idea of cryodynamics. It is not my invention, it's not you. It, is, it stems from the year 1929, when, uh, when Hubble described the Hubble law. And there was a, uh, a, a Belgian priest named Le Maître, who a year before Hubble already published most of the results of Hubble and proposed the Big Bang. The idea that the redshift of galaxies, that is the larger, the stronger, the farther away the galaxies are, that this redshift is due to expansion, to a recession. So like the Doppler shift, if something is moving away, the sound becomes uh, elongated in its wavelength, in the same way uh, the, the light from distant galaxies is being increased in its wavelength because everything is expanding. And we know the, big, the, the, the model of the balloon that is being blown up and the distance between the points on the surface of the balloon is, exp is increasing and this would explain this phenomenon of expansion. And the whole planet knows about the Big Bang, believes in the Big Bang. It's a big dogma that could be used to characterize our epoch. So the Big Bang is, is behind this idea of cryodynamics. Why is there a connection between the non-existence of the Big Bang, as it turns out, and cryodynamics? So either cryodynamics is correct or the Big Bang is correct. And so, if you wish, you can already decide you believe in the Big Bang, and therefore you, it's no use to listen to me any longer because I'm saying something which opposes this big dogma on the planet. But it's not my fault. <laughs> I'm not trying to show. <laughs> it's the fault of Fritz Zwickis. <laughs> because in the same year, <laughs> Fritz Zwicky wrote a paper in which he claimed that he could explain the same phenomenon that is explained by expansion by something for which he coined a new word, a new term. He called it dynamical friction. <coughs> dynamical friction means that if you are a photon that is traveling through the universe, and there are all these galaxies around which you have to negotiate and they all are moving randomly at quite high uh, velocities then you would lose energy just by negotiating your way through this moving type of, of uh, gravitational effects a very strange idea of Zwicky's. So this is due to purely gravitational effects, not the scattering or anything like that? Exactly. Okay. It would be, yes, and, and it would be dependent on the galaxies being in, in, in motion. Mm -hmm. If they were stationary, there would be no change in the energy, because you would go into a, a valley of, of, mm -hmm. of energy and come out at the same level. Mm -hmm. But if they are all moving, mm -hmm. then sometimes you come out with more energy, mm -hmm. sometimes with less energy, and um, the amazing thing is that, on average, you lose energy if the galaxies are moving at random with their potential dips into which you have to go as a, as a photon. Uh, then Zwicky made, uh, no, uh, yeah, Zwicky made a mistake, a, a psychological mistake. He got a letter from Eddington the most famous astronomer of his time, and Eddington showed that he had made an error, a calculational error in his paper. 
and Edmund Zwicky immediately made this public that he had been contradicted by the Pope of the field and tried to, to negotiate a, a, around this contradiction. And of course, he didn't succeed in that. Everybody was la making a laughing stock, stock out of Zwicky at the time because he had made a mistake. Dynamical friction is absolute nonsense because it is based on a numerical error made in his paper. And he tried to survive that. He later did other very big things. He showed that he was worth the, the, uh, the attention that he had gotten. Uh, so th that's a quite interesting story. I, I could go on for hours <laughs> giving you here historical details. But the, the, the next number which I have to write down is 1943, when someone who is very famous, Chandra is his name, Subrahmanyan Chandrasekhar wrote a paper, published a paper in, in a famous physics journal. I used to know the name. <coughs> journal, uh, Astronomical journal. Astrophysical journal. Astrophysical, Astrophysical yeah. journal. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and in that paper, he uses, the, the paper is titled Dynamic Reflection. So it, is, it has to do with the topic, but strangely, he does not mention Zwicky in the paper. And Chandrasekhar had a close relationship with Eddington, which was a love-hate relationship. Eddington had brought him to England when he was 19 years old. He had had his famous idea about uh, the collapse of stars on, 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 on the voyage from India to England on the ship. And somehow uh, uh, Chandrasekhar and Eddington uh, uh, did not jibe too well. So it is understandable, maybe, that Chandrasekhar used the word dynamical friction in his paper, but did not mention Zwicky. And it would be interesting to learn whether they ever met the, these two people. Okay, but uh, that's just historical stuff at the moment. Did he, did he give dynamical yeah. friction the same meaning? Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, but strangely, he did not talk about the cosmos at all in this paper. He only talked about a much smaller collection of gravitating objects, namely stars. And what he was talking about was a so-called globular cluster of stars. And we have globular clusters in the Milky Way galaxy, quite a lot of them. And they are all not in the disk of the galaxy, almost all. They are mostly in the, in the spherical uh, uh, cloud, which contains in the middle the galactic disk. And these uh, globular clusters are very old. Uh, they, they used to be 15 billion years old until people decided that the universe has only 13.7 billion years. So now they are a little bit, they have grown a little bit, bit younger through this effect. But uh, they are the oldest known objects in the universe. There's no question about this. Visible star-like objects. And these globular clusters, globular clusters, um, have the property, yes, they are very old, as I said, but uh, I should briefly tell you the discrete distribution function. So the density of globular clusters is very, very high in the middle and falls off like the retina, the sensitivity of our retina, the sharpness of vision. So, so if you take a picture, either you see a very small little speck of light, or if you take this uh, a more sensitive uh, photographic plate that you don't see much, that you, then it, it's not so impressive anymore, that the, that the density and, and brightness is so much higher in the middle. And so in the middle of these globular clusters, you do get so-called triple collisions. They never, two stars are too small, they never collide, even in a globular cluster. But sometimes three of them come together, and one is then being shot out at very high velocity, because two of them can stay together, and their, their gravitational energy will be <coughs> transformed into the motion energy. So it very often happens that if this is your globular cluster, that a star is shooting out from the middle at very high velocity. And the question Chandrasekhar asks is, why do they still exist 
if all the time stars are being expelled from the middle. They should long have been evaporated, but they, are, they do not evaporate. Why do the globular clusters not evaporate? Answer dynamic refraction. That is, we have all the moving stars, the fast star in the middle is moving outwards, but then the other stars are breaking it by the same mechanism that Zwicky had proposed for the light going through the cosmos. And Chandrasekhar gave 45 equations in his paper, and it's very difficult equations, stochastic partial differential equations, like those used by Einstein in, in the theory of, uh, of uh, Brownian motion. Uh, I need a second uh, of these uh, little pages. Thank you very much. It's, it's such an interesting story. I could talk for this too long. I don't have so much time. But uh, this is the historical origin of the whole context. But I'm willing to bet Chandrasekhar did not make a mistake. Sorry? I'm willing to bet that Chandrasekhar did not make a exactly. mistake. Yes. Uh, no one was able to reproduce his results, but no one ever got right. <laughs> That's typical. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we know now that, that dynamic refraction exists. But there are big textbooks about this. For example, Bini, Bini and Tremaine have a big textbook called Galactic Dynamics, very interesting book. And in it, they, of course, have a chapter on this topic, and they explain it away. They say it is because of Maxwell's velocity distribution. If you have one fast molecule or atom in a gas, which is very fast, it also will be bright. So Chandrasekhar did nothing but show that Maxwell is still correct under these conditions. And Maxwell is just ordinary statistical mechanics, thermodynamics, therefore everything is fine, there's nothing special about it. And this, this is not true, because Chandrasekhar had a footnote in his paper where he shows that if the mass of the star that is being shot out from the middle is much lower than the average mass, then it will still be braked. And this would absolutely contradict Maxwell. According to Maxwell, this star would deserve a much higher velocity because of its lower mass. So, so there is a question mark that remained after this, that whether Maxwell would still be applicable if, uh, if applied to a globular star cluster or to the cosmos. Or so the spirit of dynamic friction, as found by Zwicky, is different than what this modern textbook by Bini and Tremaine, I hope I spell them correctly, there's a second edition recently of this wonderful book, uh, what they interpreted. And I have to say that Chandrasekhar himself also mentioned Maxwell's distribution. So he did not completely clarify in his own mind whether his new result is in accord with Maxwell or contradicts Maxwell. One of his, his footnotes would contradict Maxwell, but he himself did not draw attention to this fact. Okay. Now we have this situation that we, we are led to believe that there exists something new in statistical physics, which contradicts Maxwell, which contradicts the usual laws of some dynamics, which contradicts everything. Uh, so it is, it's just, that's called an an anomaly. And strangely, this anomaly was not recognized for many decades. And, uh, and Zwicky and Sandra Seca, as I said, probably never met. And, and so it's very hard to explain why this could be led uh, left uh, standing there as an open question that no one found interesting, no one took up. Now I have to, uh, that's, that's the second part of, of this story. Uh, I, I have a pupil in Tübingen, his name is Dieter Fröhlich. Who is responsible for most of my paper that I wrote in the last 30 years? 
and he has been in my, in my classroom all the time, and he never got a position. He was not my student, actually. He had, he had a PhD supervisor, and this didn't work for many years, but it's not, so I'm not responsible for his lack of academic success. But he has very many papers together with me, and he's responsible for everything I say. <laughs> <laughs> And in, in 2003, uh, we rediscovered this phenomenon of, of Chandrasekhar, of, of Zwicky, in the cosmos, uh, because we, we wondered what would happen to a, yeah, to, to a particle moving through the cosmos if, it is, uh, if all the galaxies are moving. And we found intuitive reasons why it should be breaked. But this was not very convincing. Uh, the paper appeared in this year, quite interesting story why it was allowed to be published. And, and uh, Ilya Prigozhin was still alive, and uh, I, I wondered whether he would accept this type of, of uh, you know, re revolution inside his own field. And, and strangely, he was not opposed to it at all. He was a very kind person. I mean, he was already quite old, and usually you get kinder when you get older. <laughs> you have not many other options. <laughs> but so, there, there, so we rediscovered the phenomenon in that in 2003, in the uh, journal Zeitschrift für Naturforschung, part A. And so uh, we, uh, we almost reached the level of Zwicky's again. But, but then uh, uh, I met a student uh, in, in Zurich, um, an American student of Iranian origin named Movasak, Ramiz Movasak. And he was on a, paper, on a subsequent paper on this stuff. And after we had published that paper in 2007, he sent me a letter with the reference to Chandrasekhar, of which I had, had no idea. So we had several papers on the same field without knowing about Chandrasekhar. And this paper of Chandrasekhar I owe to Ramiz Mubasak. And uh, this, uh, this suddenly showed that we had not been wrong, on the wrong track with our rediscovery of the explanation of redshift due to dynamical friction. We didn't have that word even. So we learned about everything from this paper by Chandra Sekhar. And, and, and then suddenly the situation was much more serious. Could it really be that something like Maxwell, something like statistical mechanics is wrong? Or that there's a, a range of applications where it does not hold, that, that where a different theory applies. And this was the origin of cryodynamics. Suddenly, thermodynamics had gotten a competitor, cryodynamics, meaning that now the same laws that we know from thermodynamics do no longer apply when the interaction, the force between the particles involved is no longer repulsive as it is in thermodynamics, it always eventually is repulsive. But if instead we replace the repulsive force in statistical mechanics by a attractive force. And, and there is, of course, many people have seen such things. For example, Penrose, Roger Penrose, in his book on the, on the Emperor, The Emperor's New Mind, I guess is the title, he has, he combines, uh, he has two series of pictures underneath each other. One is uh, ent the entropic arrow, where, where energy is dissipated and ev eventually everything has the same energy and underneath he shows that in gravity something else applies, eventually everything goes into many or one black hole. So in gravity everything is concentrated, in, in uh, statistical mechanics everything is dissipated, but this was just pictorial. It was nothing uh, deeper mathematically. And the question is, if it is true that if we replace a gas of mutually repulsive particles by a gas of mutually attractive particles, that then suddenly we no longer have an entropy increase, but actually an entropy decrease 
or you could call it an ectropy increase. So the, the question is whether indeed we have a real competition to thermodynamics, not just as a field, cryodynamics, but also with absolutely different results. And no one has ordered that so far. Well, let me just make one point though. Black yes. holes do yeah. have the maximum entropy for a given volume. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, uh, doesn't that sort of go against the idea of entropy decreasing because uh, it's all yeah, coagulated? Yeah, very good, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you see, uh, it's, uh, you know too much. <laughs> uh, this entropy of black holes that we owe to, to Hawking mostly and Beckenstein, yes, uh, doesn't exist. It's a mistake, it's an error. But that's a different story. Okay. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Sorry? <laughs> no, we'll move on. We'll yeah, okay. But, but it's, it's, it's important. I mean, usually if you find one uh, error in physics at one point, mm -hmm. there are others also, and there's a whole collusion. But it's not an error, it's just an oversight. Cryodynamics has been overlooked. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't contradict anything we know. And, and, but, but then one asks the question, if there have been very many simulations of interacting galactic bodies of, of numerical simulations of, of the universe expanding and, and everything, and no one has ever seen any trace of this phenomenon mm -hmm. in computers. Mm -hmm. So we tried intervening to reproduce the phenomenon in computers. And I had some old friends in America, uh, um, John Kozak will not be angry with me if I mention his name here, a very good friend from old days. And he and his friend Jack Brzezinski, uh, there's some more sets in the name, uh, uh, they, uh, at, uh, at uh, DePaul University in Chicago, did some simulations in, in several, with several particles and it didn't work. So that's a very important question. How about simulation? Is it possible to reproduce this Chandrasekhar Swicky phenomenon? And it has not been reproduced for a long time. <coughs> Until in Tübingen, a student of mine, a doctor student, <coughs> had the idea to simplify the question very, very much so that eventually you have only two particles interacting and the two particles actually interact not in two dimensions we had simulations which, which didn't work in two dimensions but in one dimension but then how could you have any interesting thing and the method he used was the following it's an older idea of which, in which I had some old publications but uh, he had, a, it's a tea tube we have a very heavy particle in the stem of the T, and we have a very light particle in the, in the, in, in the bar of the T. This is moving in one dimension here, and actually this cannot cross, so they don't see each other, but they interact by gravitation or else by propulsion. We can change the potential. So we have a two particle system one has a low mass, one has a high mass, one has much energy, one has little energy, and we can both apply a Newtonian potential, and we can apply a, a repulsive potential, which looks the same with, with a change of sign, a, a sign flip. And, and, and he, he did numerical simulations on that with a highly accurate numerical algorithm in, for Hamiltonian dynamics, a symplectic algorithm of the fourth order. He, he comes from numerical mathematics and symplectic. So, so this is a technique and, and, and it, it's, it's acceptable. And, and he found that indeed he could, yeah, this, this has high mass, this has low mass, and if we have repulsion between the two, 10 minutes, if we have repulsion between the two, then indeed this high mass particle is giving away energy to the low mass particle which was faster but has less mass, it gets even faster. And if we invert the, 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 the 
the, the potential so that they become repulsive, uh, attractive rather than repulsive, it's just the, the wrong way, then we have the opposite result. That is, he reproduced in seven out of 11 simulations successfully the predictions made by cryodynamics, by, by this phenomenon of, of Zwicky and Chandrasekhar. And, and this result uh, is the first evidence that it, the whole thing might be correct. That indeed, if we have repulsion uh, instead of, not if we have attraction instead of repulsion, we do get something where the, the, the where it is not equipartition that is what is being uh, generated in, 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 in chaotic interaction between two particles, but the opposite, anti equipartition. And this is, if you wish, this is a very low, lowly, very little basis for founding a new physics upon it, a new, a new fundamental discipline in physics called cryodynamics. Only because we have this single result, numerical result, apart from results from Chandrasekhar and Nenswicki. And so you might be very skeptical. Is it really? Is it really possible that, that a new discipl fundamental discipline in classical physics called statistical cryodynamics exists besides statistical thermodynamics? And so this is, at this point I feel very, very weak. And then I, I must switch to the title of this talk. <laughs> So, so you now, I hope, mistrust me deeply with the whole thing. <laughs> but then there was this notion of the ITER, of this machine, which is still not being, not working. I think it is in southern France. I'm not sure where people really are doing it. And, and they, they hope to generate free energy for the first time out of, uh, of uh, is it the thermonuclear fusion, so that there are helium atoms and lithium atoms, and, 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 and they, 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 they have magnetic bodies, it's called a to tokamak mm -hmm. uh, machine, reactor, which is the magnetic confinement of very hot plasma. And the, the machine has the tendency that it gets unstable, and then the plasma uh, reaches the wall, and it, it gets cold, cooled immediately. And so it breaks down. It, never, it doesn't work. It never. It, 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 it so far does not. Uh, there, there's no chance visible at the moment how to make the machine really work. But as soon as it would work, it would of course solve an, um, humankind's energy problem, because we then would have unlimited free energy, and the oil would no longer be very important. It would be. One could, this question I'm talking about here would be called the billion dollar question. Is cryodynamics nonsense or not? And a lot of money is suddenly attached to the question I was addressing. It was purely uh, cosmological nonsense. Who needs cosmology after all? <laughs> but here suddenly we are down to earth. And the question arises. It's actually a trillion dollar question. So it's actually a trillion dollar question. <laughs> it's, it's trivial. <laughs> no, trillion. It's a trillion dollar question. Trillion. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. A billion is nothing anymore. Yeah. There right. you go. That's more like it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Trillion. <laughs> so, so we now have two things that seem to contradict each other. On the other one hand, we have the question, who ordered that? Who needs cryodynamics? On the other hand, if it exists, suddenly, it could be very attractive to, to, uh, to invest some time into it and some research. So I hope even, uh, I have some five more minutes or so, uh, but, uh, so I hope you won't be too disappointed if you leave this talk, because maybe it is something that eventually might uh, gain, might make, might cause you to become interested in this type of thinking even though it is quite old-fashioned uh, 19th century uh, 
thermodynamics type thinking. It's pre-quantum stuff. It's out of fashion for many decades. But, but still, thermodynamics is a fundamental discipline in physics. And I should perhaps mention that a pupil of mine named Hans Diebner uh, did wonderful classical statistical mechanical simulations where he found a deterministic entropy formula. So one can calculate in computers entropy with deterministic formulas and if this is true, as I think it is, then we can also calculate a deterministic entropy which would apply to cardinomics. So you would really have a kind of parallelism between two fundamental classical disciplines. One would be thermodynamics, the other cryodynamics. And in cryodynamics we could profit, yes, but I, I should now briefly tell you maybe why I think that the ITER or ITER could be made, uh, yeah, could be tamed by means of cryodynamics. And, and the idea is, if, if there is this, this uh, uh, torus type uh, plasma confined somehow and, and it becomes unstable, it develops a, a bulge on the surface and there, there is the wall and as soon as the bulge reaches the wall the, 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 the reaction stops. Uh, as, uh, would it be possible to this hot to, 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 to cool, locally cool the, the hot protons? And the idea is, if it is true that we have this uh, cooling mechanism in, 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 in the cosmos or in cryodynamics, then you know, one could inject particles which have a higher kinetic energy than the, the protons there to cool them. Very, uh, so you, you use even hot particles to cool the too hot particles. And this could be electrons and you could use electron uh, synchrotrons that are shooting in electrons from different sides onto the pocket which becomes unstable and if it were true that indeed cryodynamics work, works that you could cool two hot particles of protons by even hotter electrons. It's very paradoxical. And, and, and uh, maybe there is, a, I made a thinking error here somewhere. But as, uh, and also we, this, this simulation of, of uh, the sunlighters, I forgot to mention his name, sunlighter, uh, uh, was this simulation uh, involved only that there was uh, the, the, the heavy particle at the stem of the T and the light particle uh, did not obey these constraints. Here the heavy particle had much energy and took away energy from the light particle. But here the question is, is, what is, is it also true that if we make the light particle uh, the energy rich particle, so it has a lot of energy but it's still light, and this has less energy here, would it still take away energy from the heavy particle? So, so, so this question here sounds quite un improbable at first sight, that you could cool heavy hot particles by even hotter light particles, electrons. But it, 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 well, the hypothesis, uh, if cardinamics exists, this is a prediction one can make. And maybe it turns out that we have to make an exception that if if the ratio between the masses is, is as we need it here, that the higher energy is in the lighter particle, then it does not, then cardinamics does not hold anymore. This is possible. This is a very new field. But at the moment, everything speaks in favor of the hypothesis that if cryodynamics, that cryodynamics exists, and if it exists, then this method ought to work. So if you wish, you can go to newspapers when you leave this school <laughs> and tell them <laughs> that you need a million dollars immediately from the newspaper, otherwise you don't have the story. <laughs> and so on. So, so there's a lot of, of, of economic interest involved in this. 
and, and that's nice because usually fundamental physics does not create so much economic <laughs> repercussions. And so that is essentially what I wanted to tell you. Maybe you have some more questions. Or I forgot many things that, that I had planned to tell, but this was the, the, gist, the gist of my argument. Thank you okay, very, thank very, you very much. much. Time for some questions. I, I'll start, I guess. I Thank, you. Some, <laughs> Thank you. Some okay. So, there's one, uh, just a rather minor point, and I'm sure that this is easily answered. But one thing that sort of confused me when you were talking about globular clusters yeah. and Maxwellian distributions, of course, the Maxwellian distribution uh, requires a heat bath, so energies are not conserved, but energy can be pumped in or taken out of the system so that things are held at a constant temperature. A globular cluster um, is a relatively isolated system. Uh, I don't know that there's any external source of energy that plays the role of a heat bath. Um, so why should one expect a Maxwellian distribution of velocities in a globular cluster? Never mind whether you're talking about attractable or repulsive interactions. <laughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> you see, I, I was thinking of the globular cluster as a gas, right. a big uh, cloud of gas. And, and this gas should, uh, well, traditionally one would think that the, the, the laws of gas theory should apply to the globular cluster. And therefore, one would expect that a Maxwellian, Maxwellian velocity distribution develops inside a globular cluster. Well, my, my, my question is that if I take a gas mm -hmm. and, I, you, and I put it inside of a, uh, you know, as a closed system so that no energy can enter or leave the system, I will not get a Maxwellian distribution. I have to have it connected to a much larger heat bath to get a Maxwellian distribution. Mm -hmm. you see that the, so I shouldn't have used the word Maxwellian. Well, no, I'm just I'm just wondering why one would. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't. This has nothing to do, I think, with mm -hmm. the arguments of cryodynamics. It's just it, it's a separate question entirely, which is why 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 should one? I mean, I would not have expected a Maxwellian distribution for globular cl cluster, and the fact that there isn't one doesn't surprise me very much. Um, that's not you know that has nothing to do with whether dynamical friction or cryodynamics is correct. It's, it's a completely separate question. It just confused me. Uh, that's all. Yeah, but yeah. that was historically the hypothesis of heading. I'm sorry? But uh, the uh, uh, assumption that there is a Maxwell uh, distribution that was the, uh, the critic of uh, heading. That's what that was. That was Eddington. Yeah. But but again, I, yeah, I don't I don't understand why that's a valid objection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually on your side here. I'm, <laughs> I'm saying that I don't understand why this is a valid objection. Yeah, that I don't see that. Point. But I don't know what mistakes Wiki made because I, I I don't I'm not familiar with the paper. I have to reveal my okay my infinite lack of knowledge, yeah. which is always good that. to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I was naively presupposing I'm up to one minute ago that if you have a gas at equilibrium in a closed box that then the, the velocity distribution in this gas at constant temperature would be a Maxwellian velocity distribution. Okay, if it's in a closed box though, yeah. then the energy is fixed, not yeah. the temperature. So when you're talking about equilibrium, mm -hmm. you're not talking about a thermal equilibrium, you're talking about something else. And I don't know that, I don't think you would expect that, that distribution. But we can we can look at that later. Let me let me let me open it up for other questions. Good. Just a small Thank time. You. Do you have some papers about the application of dynamics to plasma code? No? Some publications or papers. Yeah. There there are uh, some publications in the form of abstracts in the American Institute of Physics. Uh, and there is a big paper is not yet accepted in a journal, it's called Chaos, so it's in revision. I hope they will accept it. And there is also a published paper already, I forgot in which journal. I can give you the reference later. Complex systems. In complex systems, yes. Last year, because in Stephen Wolfram's journal. I know yes. people in Moscow who are very, very interested in the problem which you mentioned. Just ah, mentioned right. so, yeah, that, that I would be very much interested also in having contacts with them. Mm -hmm. And of course, 
science is a big, big sea, and there must be islands <laughs> which have similar uh, topics. And wonderful. Thank you very Thank much. You. I will need the names. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, I, I probably have a naive question. So you showed them. Yeah, the most dangerous questions. <laughs> no, those are the best ones. Yeah, exactly. That makes you sharpen your, your ideas. <laughs> um, you, you showed them that, that you know, um, ITAP and, and really the energy. So, do you propose that the energy balance um, would be, um, it would, would, um, would infer that you gain energy from that? So, you need some energy to actually accelerate the electrons. Yeah, yeah, of right. course. Yeah, you, you give them a high temperature, a lot you, of energy. You, need, uh, you inject water. energy into the item, even yeah. more energy, yes. Yeah, so, so how is, is that going to be used in, in, um, in, in gaining the energy or the solving the, the, the energy problem we have? Yeah. yeah. So, so have you looked at the balance, that this, this thing, so that the, the overall balance would be then gaining energy instead of actually... I, 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 I think I get your point, yes. So, so the machine... ITER is built to generate free energy out of the fusion of atomic nuclei, which we know, as in the sun, of which we know, we know many, many details, how energy is being created within the sun. And the same process would take place in the ITER if it worked, if it could be kept stable. Because it does, must not reach the walls, as I said. So it must be confined, but as long as you can, con can confine it, it indeed produces heat, energy, and this heat can be used to uh, for, can be is useful. It is, it's economically very valuable. But uh, the question uh, so far, uh, the ITER always became unstable, so that as soon as it started to produce more energy than you needed to heat the gas inside, it it fizzled, and this fizzling could be uh, stopped by locally interfering with this place which goes out of control. And this interfering could be done by shooting in several beams of electrons which produce a very, an even higher temperature gas of electrons around this spot which is too high in its temperature. So by putting in even higher temperature electrons, the idea is to cool the two hot protons very counterintuitive. But thank you for your clarifying question. Thank you. Yeah, I see, see one question that comes up with this idea that you were just describing it, yes. is you turn this tokamak on and you get this plasma going around in the torus, yeah. and you don't know where it's going to fizzle. Exactly. Yes. So you have to be able to cool it at any point around the torus. Yeah, you have to be able to detect the fizzling before it has mm -hmm. gone out of control. But apparently this, this can be done, so one can find out where this instability is developing. One only has no means to curb it. That is my state of knowledge, but maybe I'm wrong here, and you know more. And no, you tell I, know, me that I, I probably know working. a good deal less. But, but uh, I, I was naively assuming, you see, I'm a layman in this field, it's new to the iterology. But uh, I thought uh, it, was, it, there, it was possible to monitor the temperature. <coughs> it, there must be a radiation profile that one can measure. And so I, I didn't see there was a big problem here, but maybe this turns out to be the crux of the whole thing. Thank you. All right, I think we need to move on, but actually before we do, I realize the answer to my question so I can tell you what it is. Uh, and so with the Maxwellian distribution, if you have an open system and a bunch of particles of equal mass and elastic collisions, then regardless of your initial velocity distribution, you'll end up with a Maxwellian distribution. If you have a closed system, then in the same thing, elastic collisions, all particles equal mass, then you'll, whatever initial velocity distribution you start with, that's exactly the same distribution you'll end with. It doesn't change in time. Because any two particles that collide, they'll just exchange their velocities. So, so you end up with the same velocity distribution you started with. In a closed system. In a closed system. So you would not say that any system at equilibrium, at thermal equilibrium, 
of days that Max Webb can do. Well, I mean, if you started in thermal equilibrium, if that a temperature team, you start in thermal equilibrium and will have a Maxwellian distribution, then you close it off, it will keep that distribution. On the other hand, if I started with a non-equilibrium distribution and I close it off, it will keep that distribution forever. That's all. But, but it's crucial to have a heat bath. I mean, that's, that's the crucial thing. I, I see. So, so, so the heat bath is... So well, that's I, I was not looking at the to have, to have a yeah. So that's the two different situations we are looking right, at. Right, right, right. Okay. So. All right, I think we need to move on. Thank you very yeah. much again, Arthur. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you very, very much. much.